Um, I'm gonna, I took my shoes, I wore shoes and I came in here and they squeak the entire time, which would drive me nuts. So I'm in socks, which is not a normal thing for me, but there you go. I hope my feet, my feet are clean, so I don't think it'll be an olfactory thing. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna talk to you about techne, all right? Um, if you saw the little blurb that I gave, um, if it seems humorous, it's not. That's the truth. Um, and what I'm not going to do is give you the reasons why what I'm saying to you works, but all of it is research-based. I'm obsessive about research-based. So if in any of the beats of what I share, you're wondering, okay, but give me the evidence and explain to me why, just come and see me. Like, the, I can't learn anything unless I know why. If somebody tells me, here, just use this formula because it works, it's like, no, no, full stop, I have to understand why. So a fault of mine is that I will always add these hyper explanations of why everything works, which means it takes me like longer than a Wagner opera to share a simple idea. But if there are any of you out there that suffer from the same affliction as I do, I can back up everything I'm doing here. There's nothing that I will bring you that is fluff. Okay? Um, the one request I would make is I want you to avoid sort of uh, doing anything other than exactly what I tell you. Okay, we're gonna do it just like a little game. Um, so I always start all work with an expression of gratitude. Very often it'll be about the place that I'm at because we're in such a beautiful part of the world. I am really grateful. One of the things I'm most grateful for uh, in the world is the iLab and Sheila Carpendale. Um, the work that Sheila has done, the work that Frank has done, that Claudia has done, that Wes is doing is remarkable. Techne is about obsessing on excellence John is, and so I put myself where excellence is. So if you're looking for excellence, see where I am. I'm not it, but I'm standing right beside it because that's what I do. I'm incredibly grateful to be working in CMD and working with the people at the iLab because of the extraordinary work there. That is not a nice thing to say. I do not say nice things. I believe that saying nice things is harmful to people and betrays everything I believe in. I point at things that are excellent, I say they are excellent, and people say, oh, that's a compliment because we live in an insane world where saying the truth sounds like a compliment. A compliment is like, those are cool shoes. Saying that the work is excellent, the work is excellent. I don't mean to send anybody into the sin of pride or something like that, academics want to be humble. I'm not talking about you as a person. You're flawed like everybody else and work on that crap. I'm talking about the work. The work is there, okay? So I am grateful for Sheila. We're gonna do a game, an idea, a theme, some applications in your questions. This is all built specifically for the series that you're in. Nothing I will bring you is to waste your time. Again, I believe that to waste your time would betray everything I believe in. So some of this may seem a little unorthodox, but I'll explain it later if you'll go with me, okay? So, one game. We need kind of the world of the game. So a game will be introduced, a novel is introduced with exposition, we have world of the play. You always need to be able to understand where you are. Reality is defined by the frame in which you find yourself. So you can immediately get somebody to believe, oh, there are dragons in this world and that makes sense. If you don't understand the world of the play, if you don't understand the world of the game, and halfway through, all of a sudden people have jetpacks, you're like, what the hell, jetpacks don't work here. But if you understand it in the framing of the world in which you're operating, the data set you are evaluating, it makes sense. Internal consistency is defined by the frame, okay? So why do you want to pay attention to this is if you don't know the rules of the game that you're playing, things are going to be much harder for you and you're maybe not going to be able to make sense of the world. And we live at a historical moment when people are using an old set of rules in a new world. I like to think of this like playing chess with a three-year-old. So you sit down to play chess, you know the rules, chess is all about rules, you're explaining the rules, and you're kicking their ass because they're three, and all of a sudden they decide that a pawn can karate kick your king. And you get upset and try to tell them, no, these are the rules, and they say, no, they're not, these are the rules. What they've done is introduced martial arts and chess rules into this new space, and you're trying to hang on to a reality that really is just its own construct. 
And we can often, when we're doing our work, get caught inside of executing inside of a game and not understanding the broader set of rules. Paying attention to the broader set of rules makes work a lot easier and can help you not produce things that are mathematically invalid. So try to understand the rules of the game you're playing. It's a time saver. Okay, so today we are playing the improvement game. This talk is the improvement game. I have promised you that I can make everything better, and I can. I can give you loads of examples. What I will tell you is the stuff that I do that can make anything better has nothing to do with me and everything to do with looking at research, right? So I, I, when I talk about this, sort of get the shock value, I have a 100% success rate with this stuff. So top athletes, top musicians, top business people, governments, large organizations, small organizations, 100% success rate. Why? I don't have a program. I go and look at what they're doing and say, let's do some experiments to improve this stuff. The other part of it is I only work with people that want to improve because I'm interested in techne. And the thing is, most people don't actually want to improve. Most people want to belong. They don't want to be actually going into these painful things. But today, we're going to play the improvement game. OK, you'll play with me. Here we go. So click. Yay, improvement game. Oh, my clicker is going slow, which is driving me nuts. So the one rule is you have to follow me. It's going to be weird. You're going to stand up, and you're going to do something. And it's going to happen again twice more. So there are going to be three times when I'm going to ask you to do something. Um, and by the way, when somebody makes me stand up when I'm at a talk, I hate them for it. You're, that's fine. Hate me. But it's going to happen. Do what I say. OK, you ready? Here we go. We're going to deal with a few different things. People are getting ready to stand up now. <laughs> I'm going to bring this to you. I'm bringing this to you from performance work, which means it should not be hard at all. Okay? And I'll walk you through it. And it's very simple. We're going to start here. Gratitude. So we want to do gratitude practice. You ready? So for gratitude practice, whoop, before we get to there, go back. I want you to think of something that you're grateful for right now. So generally, don't look at me because you're not very grateful for me now that I've just told you I'm going to make you do something. Look down or close your eyes. Think of something you're grateful for. People will like overthink this, like being alive is pretty good. You can breathe oxygen. Like there's a lot of terrible stuff in the world. Think of a thing you're grateful for. Are you thinking of it? I'm going to ask you to come back to it. So just get it. Are you working on it? I see some of you looking at me. Maybe you are grateful for me, in which case, like get a life. <laughs> Got it? Good. Physical. Here we go. I will get up. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you something. Don't do it until you see me do it. This is the natural stance of a human being. This is the way we should be doing things. We're getting together to be really smart. All of the evidence we have is sitting is destroying you, right? Sitting is worse for you than smoking, they now say. And we get together and sit all of the time. And we're computer folks, and there's a lot of sitting involved with that. So I'm going to ask you to squat. But wait. I said wait. <laughs> Here's the way squatting works in performance world. Some people are going to squat and their butt's going to nearly hit the floor. Some people are going to go just this much. There is no right or wrong way. The right way is the way for your body where weight is just going to go back to your heels and that's it. Okay? It, with performance work, it's always about your instrument, your individual instrument. So don't get hung up on, oh, I don't do yoga or any of that stuff. Just do this. Okay? Here we go. We're going to squat just to wherever you're comfortable. Kind of reach out forward. And then all you're going to do is with right, you're going to send the right up and look up, come back, and then the left and look up and come back, and now stand back up. That's the whole exercise. It's going to happen twice more as you go. Techne social, stay standing. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, hello, my name is Patrick Finn. So I'm going to say hello, the word hello, a gap, my name is a gap, and then my full name, and I'm going to push the final letter. I've got a hard one because I've got a soft ending thing. You need to push the last letter. There's a reason for this, but we're going to do it together. And I want you to do it at full voice because we tend to do things at quiet voice and we're all doing it at once. So don't worry. Nobody's going to be able to hear you. They're going to be worried about how they sound ridiculous. So don't worry about you sounding ridiculous. Are you ready for this? Okay. So you're going to do hello, a gap. My name is a gap. And then your full name, push the ending of the name. Ready? One. Two, three, go. Hello, my, my name, name is, is Patrick Finn. Yeah? 
Good. You can sit down. I want you to say one other phrase with me, okay? Are you ready? I can learn anything. I can learn anything. I can learn anything. Here you go. One, two, three, go. I can learn anything. Good. The next time you see this coming around, it's going to be integrated and it's going to be, I'm thinking of that grateful thing. Hello, my name is Patrick Finn and I can learn anything. And then you're going to come back up, okay? It'll be coming up. Thank you, by the way. I know that that's annoying. <laughs> one idea. The one idea is techne. So what you should do is study techne and nothing else, and if you do, everything in your life will be better. <laughs> Full stop. Okay? You are what you repeatedly do. There's a famous phrase, right? The second part of this is there. You don't need the second part. But there is nothing more important than understanding the nature of this phrase. So techne comes from an ancient conversation Back in the beginnings, it's, uh, we, we see it first inside of uh, Plato and Aristotle debating out of Socrates. Do not get hung up on, oh, it was just a Western conversation. Uh-uh. The conversation around techne was happening through all of the areas that were interconnected. So you've got a separation with the Americas, but the discussion of techne was in all civilizations, and you can find it in all ancient texts, and it really is getting passed around the various trade routes. We happen to have it coming up through English language because of its, the way that it surfaced through Plato and Aristotle, but techne is how you do, what you do, when you do, what you do, with no consideration for anything else, that it's a primary question. This phrase comes out of Aristotle talking about if you want to get good at this, if you want to develop techne, you need to understand that you are what you repeatedly do. People focus on the excellence part. You're iLab people. You're already excellent. Here's the trick, though. This thing is much more frightening than we would like to admit. When you're focusing on the excellence, it's about, oh, working a little harder or something, and it's like, uh-uh. If what you do is we get together like this, and I am going to be teaching you Spanish, we work on Spanish. Yes, we get together, we do it, and we do it every day. Some of you get amazing, some of you get kind of medium good, some of you barely get any better, but you get a little better because you are what you repeatedly do. That's what we tend to think of this, right? Which is, I've only got so much time, I'd like to get better at tennis, and so I'm gonna give a lot of time to it, and then I will get better because we are what we repeatedly do. The real profundity of this is, you are what you repeatedly do in all aspects. So, if you have a practice of working at low capacity, if you decide to change that, you're not starting from zero. You've got a practice of mediocrity. Techne teaches you to pay attention to not phoning it in. So you get to a work thing and you say like, ah, I hate this meeting or I hate these people, so I'm only just gonna do about 75%. I don't really need to worry about it. They don't even deserve my 75% because I'm amazing and these people are duds. You're not giving just 75%. You are developing and strengthening muscles of performing at a mediocre level. You are what you repeatedly do. Every pattern that you have strengthens. And so focusing on excellence is too easy. The terror comes in allowing yourself to accept poor treatment from yourself, from others, etc. You don't end up getting to stop that. You can stop what's going on, but then you're working from negative numbers to get back to zero before you can begin to develop. All right? This is why techne is such a powerful area of focus. How you do, what you do, when you do, what you do. Knowledge trees. Oh, and by the way, so where tech, why techne is also relevant, the word sort of comes up through the language, and once they hit the Renaissance and we get the printing press, logos, right, words, how we do, what we do, when we do, what we do in the age of words becomes technology. And because of that obsession with technology, technologos, we get the word technical for the scientific and rational side. The artists and craftspeople then say, well, yeah, that doesn't cover us, so we get the word technique. And eventually we get to information technology, where we're now adding whole other words. All that matters is techne. How we do, what we do, when we do, what we do. Everything is technology, right? This is hand technology, 
computer, like all, so the idea of separating things out is not part of this. Techne is not a rejection of current disciplinary paths and things like that. It's starting from a place where you don't take them up in the first place. There is no reason to accept a frame unless you're doing it with intention. Okay, so I was like, how the heck do I explain how this works? And I started thinking, well, knowledge trees is a good way to go after this. When you're dealing with techne and you start to say, look, I can improve everything and let's think about everything, it's like, well, that seems to be a, a lot. I'm quite busy with my not everything. Um, so you need some ways around it. And so I thought, like, let's think about trees. So uh, trees can teach us a lot about this. We often talk about knowledge trees and various types of trees within framings of various organizational things. So consider a tree. There's a phrase, um, can't see the forest for the trees. Have you heard of this phrase? The notion there, right, and this is, an, this is a phrase that pops up everywhere, the notion there is you're not understanding the game. You're not seeing where you are because you're focused on the minutia. And look, you have to refine your approach to minutia, but if you don't understand that you're in a forest, your minutia are inherently undercut. You're not saving time. So when you're dealing with complex, complex knowledge sets with limited time, you wanna get as close to the origin of the knowledge tree as is humanly possible for greatest effect. Boosh, go. So if you think of the knowledge tree then, sort of the core of the knowledge coming up through the tree, we then get all these offshoots. And we tend to specialize out in one of those offshoots. So you meet a bunch of people and it's like, oh, hi, I'm the new hire in math. And it, that's not the end of it, right? You then have this specialization. You're a branch off this core, but you're with a group of people and your frame of knowledge, your methodological rigor is defined by a root, right? And if you don't go any further than that, down into the roots of all of it, you're missing the integration part. So now, what is so exciting is finally, click, we're getting to a place where we say like, like so I'm an old guy, my entire career, everyone has been talking about interdisciplinarity. We want more interdisciplinarity, it's terrible. Interdisciplinarity is a nightmare, it doesn't work. Because what you do is you put two trees beside each other, right? It's inefficient. It's hard enough to be good at one discipline. It takes a lifetime of work. If you're gonna to have to now take on another one and master that and then put them together, it's going to be nearly impossible. So what we end up doing is, for interdisciplinarity, we start to overlap knowledge sets way up the tree. We stick to our knowledge set, we say we're being interdisciplinary, but now we're in a whole other knowledge set and we've connected way up that tree using its internal logic, which means we're inherently out of our depth. You wanna focus on the fact that all of the trees, all of their roots are always connected. And so come from that place of that core understanding of what is the knowledge game? What is the knowledge practice? What is the core understanding for something rather than this current piece I'm supposed to accept? Because if you enter collaborative practice from a place of the most recent collaboration, you don't have the ability to check for validity. Okay, ready? Here we go. So what you're gonna do is we're integrating this now. Remember the gratitude piece. You can be grateful that I stopped talking for a second. Think of the gratitude piece. Don't skip this, it's not hard. It takes a few seconds. What are you grateful for? And then we're gonna go into our squad and say, hello, my name is Patrick Finn, and I can learn anything. Good, up you get, you're done, see? I taught you all those things and now I made it shorter. One theme, data empowerment. If you look at the series, what this is all about, what's going on and what all of the talks have been, they actually hit all the elements that I'm going to talk about. But there's this way of speaking about data empowerment in there that is, you know, like how do we empower our data? How do we democratize all of this? And given that I'm a techne person, I'm gonna say, well, what if empowerment isn't the problem and democracy isn't the problem? In the matrix, what happens is Neo doesn't understand that he already has the power. Data is already empowered. In fact, data is extraordinarily powerful. And what you really wanna be engaging with is not getting more power, but making sure that you use the power for the forces of good as opposed to going over to the dark side. 
That's the easy one. The hard one is where you think you're using it for the forces of good and you cause massive problems, right? So what is empowered data democratized? I'm not going to go into the huge kerfuffle over Ansel Keys, but what we know is this is someone who dedicated his life to helping the world. Famously creates the seven country study. From a study of 22 countries, he eliminated the ones that didn't fit what he wanted to do. He produced data that was extraordinarily convincing. And the numbers we have now, remember, he was trying to make the world a better place. The numbers we have now, we say we're closing in. He, he long ago passed the point where his change of the approach to diet inside of the Western diet has led to more deaths than World War II. He's closing in on outdoing the numbers for both world wars. So data is quite powerful and really can reach the public um, and can be so powerful that you can still be killing people after you are dead. So Neo, you already have the power. Don't you understand the frame that you're in? You might want to learn about how to surf and be in this power rather than thinking you need more power. Be careful with what can happen. And there are reasons for this. Because we live in this strange time where for you, you know data very well. But we're in the kind of because data realm. So we know that within medical death, into the low double digits is because prescribing doctors don't understand the stats in the reports that tell them to prescribe a drug. People don't read everything. You hear people making big arguments and saying, because data, and they don't understand the statistics and haven't read the article. People get very committed to data. They'll believe it when you tell them, right? And people like solutions when they're feeling that the world is a bit chaotic. And so the other one we have is this someone said a thing. So someone says a thing, and then someone else says, as so-and-so has shown, it's like, no, someone said a thing. Like some people, you'll hear almost always at the end of news stories, some people believe this could lead to chaos in the government. Well, some people believe that Elvis is alive. Like some people believe a lot of crazy ass stuff. So you want to be cautious with how the data goes out and understand what can be done with your data and how it can be used against you. It was one of the things that I learned. So my dad used to work at StatsCan and when I was a little kid, I learned two big lessons, basically. First, I was like, I don't know, 14 or something like that. I was supposed to help with the trucks. It was a census year. So there was stuff for the boxes that I could move, because like I knew nothing. I was 14. But the truckers went on strike, so now I'm stuck in the office. So they got me running around the office. And like, I'm a young, sort of stupid guy. All of these women from the office kept asking me to go for coffee with them. And so immediately I reached the obvious conclusion that these you know, amazing 20-something women are all in love with 14-year-old me and figuring out you know, how to spend time with me until my father takes me aside and says, yeah, you're the boss's son and they're taking longer breaks because they're taking you with them. Please stop doing that. <laughs> the other thing that I realized is this is back when StatsCan didn't charge for statistical analysis. You could get as many studies as you wanted for free. And so people just came all of the time to keep asking for the data they needed to prove what they wanted to say. They weren't using the data as evidence. They weren't using the data as something to inform broader discussion, to democratize. They were using it to manipulate. Also, we live in a time of, I'm gonna introduce you to a new term that I'm hoping we'll catch on, hoo poo. We hear a lot, there have been some pretty good books even on bullshit. And I sort of will often ask people like, come on, what percentage of what's going on at university do you think is bullshit? Now, I'm not gonna make you say it out loud, but when I've had people say it out loud, the percentage isn't like, oh, 9%. It tends to be a fairly substantial number. What I'm gonna tell you is that is actually quite offensive because bullshit actually grows things. It's fecund. You can get better crops. Bullshit is productive, whereas human poo spews out and ruins everything. Nothing can grow 
from bad information. Nothing can grow from bad ideas. So we owe a huge apology to our bovine friends <laughs> for insulting bullshit. Okay. So what happens then for you folks, and I know you know this by the way, I'm wanting to hit at this big level tree thing, is that we get sort of the famous Erasmus quote, but it's also come out of a lot of the ancient religious texts as well, the notion that um, in the valley of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. So what you can get are false positives on your research because when no one understands math or stats and you've got this research and it looks beautiful, they're like, oh yeah, that is clearly the thing that we should believe. I must drink red wine and eat dark chocolate has now been proven. People are ready to believe in something. And we are in a time of great change when the population is looking for solidity anywhere. So you can convince people of almost anything. And we're all working in a realm where the rate of publication of really exciting stuff is breathtaking. And I'm so glad that that's the case. But in those types of environments, you begin to look at work and say, ooh, you're kind of crossing four different statistical models there and then saying they all work together to reach this conclusion, but this pie chart is gorgeous, right? We want to be aware that when there are very few people that actually understand the data, they're going to trust you. And when, particularly when you get into the place where it's like, hey, we're really good at making this beautiful and aesthetically compelling so that I now really believe it and you still understand that this is not like a carved in stone truth, they're taking it as that in many cases, right? So when we think about empowering data, it's no, 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 we've got a lot of power. The scary part is you got an awful lot of power. Okay, now here's a really terrifying one that uh, I've, I've been sort of working on and it's, it's, it's I get frightened to even bring it up, but here we go. So if we're talking about data visualization, we're talking to you folks, we're, we are sort of gonna say, well, I've got some basic understanding of the nature of color and how that can be used and, and, and how it sort of can uh, lead us in certain types of directions. Within our language, there's a, a phrase that is everywhere, it's been around for a long time, that talks about an oversimplification of ideas. There are no black and white solutions. There are no uh, black or white questions. There are no black or white, like the idea that Everything is really too complex. And the reason we use this is, this is one of the core ideas for people. Because everywhere, across all language sets, you've got your, an experience of, hey, it's like dark and I can't see anything. And then, hey, it's not dark anymore and I can see things. So the black or white distinction is in every language set everywhere in the world. And so this notion of life is more complex than those pieces is a big deal. But here's the thing. Of all the problems there are in the world, and there are many, the problem between black and white people is one of the worst. Absolute horror show, unbelievable suffering, murder, torment, like beyond really our imagination, right? We would agree with that. There are no black and white people. What you do when you want to commit an atrocity is you get people to believe a falsehood at the root of the language system. When people got labeled as black, it was because it wasn't real. You'd say to a person, this person is that thing, and then everyone says, yes, they're that thing. And the horror begins. I am not in any way and never would minimize the profound torment that our world has experienced because of this, I am pointing out that if we think we're really smart about data visualization and language and color, and we've got really smart people, Harvard professors on TV saying, well, I'm black. And it's like, yeah, you are, but except no, right? And black and white aren't colors either. So like the one good thing, if you're caught in this whole terrible nightmare of racial crap, is that if you're a brown person, you'll hear people saying, well, I'm a brown person. At least you're in earth tones. You're into life, right? Like that actually is the spectrum that we're in. 
And this is why when the origins of the black or white stuff was used on people, a lot of the people that were called black were actually lighter than the people that were labeling them black. It wasn't about the color of their skin. It's about getting you to accept a label that is fundamentally false. If I poison the root of the tree, it doesn't matter how hard you work on the branches, you're missing the major issue. The simplest language explanation we have, there are no black or white problems, and we are still killing one another, saying it's really difficult to be white, particularly given that I'm not white and everyone knows it, right? And I get how uncomfortable that is. I'm pointing it out not to be disruptive, but to say, you want to look at a problem, you got to go upstream to see that this is where the problem came from. This is what the language set does. I label you as something inappropriate, you're dehumanized, you're detached from reality, and the nightmare begins. And when it's really effective, we begin saying that to ourselves. We label ourselves with a fundamentally false label that has been imposed upon us. That was heavy, eh? I'm glad he's done that part about that terrible stuff in the world. Gratitude. What are you grateful for? Actually think about it. Actually think about it. Here we go. Hello? Hello. My name is Patrick Finn. And I can learn anything. Thank you. You're not going to have to stand up again. Techne, application. So those are theoretical models. There's the idea, giving you some quick hits on trying to shake the frame, right, of where these things would sit. It's not going to matter much, though, unless we can deal with application. So once again, the idea that, oh, I can fix anything, like, why don't we study everything? What, why, I'm, I'm interested in everything. And so I'm sick of saying, like, well, I study this one. No, I don't. I study techne. I'm interested in absolutely everything. I have limited time. That's the only reason I'm making choices. But you have a time paradox. So if you become interested in studying everything, you're like, well, how am I going to fit this into my calendar? And that's why there's a paradox. Because if you embrace studying everything, you will save time, not lose time. Okay? And there's many examples. I'll give you a bunch. Um, but I'll give you some simple ones. Let's go to the root of our tree, the core of our tree. And don't bristle when you see this art-science divide that has art at the essence of everything. Art means the creation of something useful in the world. Its ancient meaning is the people who create something. They're the ones with techne. Science is thinking stuff that doesn't get out of your head. You create, you work, you experiment so that you can understand. Art and science, this notion that they're separate. So Sheila builds CMD. There's a reason why I worship Sheila. I've been talking about techne for like 30 years. She just did it. I'm like, oh, well, OK. I could have done that too and been doing it instead of being like old and yelling at people. <laughs> and here's the, here's the weird piece, is after that, you get all this other stuff, right? I am focused on creating. I am focused on the generative forces of the universe. I am focused on the discovery of the scientist, the new artistic work done with excellence. That is my commitment. I have to prioritize. So I get that you're having your political fights and you want me to sign up for your team, and I am interested. It's just that I've only got so much time, and I'm focused on the core. This is why basic science and hardcore art has always led to greater change than any other sector. Whenever you get these people coming in and saying, hey, let us tell you how to do your science. Let us tell you how to do your art. No one has ever said, we're really close in this experiment. If only we could get a few people from the government here to give us some advice, we know we would be there. Prioritize. Solving for time integration. I was just at a, an amazing conference with a bunch of people from here, and I was, because I was in this knowledge tree thing, I was hunting for a tree to use as an example. Here you go. Focus on integration. In a world of wanting to study everything, what you do is you integrate the way that you work so you never waste time. Once you get out to a knowledge evaluation of what the entire game is, you can be much simpler. 
The practices for this are things, exercises that can be quite simple, right? You've got a five sentence paragraph that describes who you are. Do you know why you're doing what you're doing? Do you know what you believe in? Can you tell me in five sentences? And if you can't, like, what the hell are you doing with your life? Like, you're the only one that knows you. I can't get in there. And I'm saying that to jar you a bit. We don't spend time on this. But the trick is, if you get that central commitment there, and don't get worried, it's like, oh, I can't get the third one. It's like, it doesn't matter. You pick and you can modify as you go. Get integrated at what you're doing. All your decision making is easier. Otherwise, you're jumping around to these different tasks, trying to make these decisions way down the knowledge tree, jerking around. Integration is the key to saving time, right? And then you can see a piece that comes over and it's like, oh, this is an interesting project, but it doesn't really connect. These trees in San Diego, which is freaking gorgeous, by the way, they grow together, right? You grow together. So I think of this, I was thinking of this actually as the, uh, I'm just glad because Ehud's out of town, but if you know Ehud, I love Ehud, okay? So Ehud is like a mighty oak, that guy. He's like huge, right? <laughs> but here's the thing. This is what I do. I'm interested in excellence, but I met Ehud, and I sit there and we're talking, and he's brilliant, but I can also feel him. He's alive. He's a human. I can feel his heart, right? He's a beautiful person. So I can trust him because from him, I met Frank and Claudia, I met Wes, I met you, I met all of the, so when I've got a good oak that I can trust, I don't have to worry about evaluating the people that he brings into my life. My integration is seamless. If that's for me, tell them I'm busy. Is that my phone? Is it my own phone? No. Oh, okay, so no. I, I can do it. Oh, okay. It's my phone. Is it? I turned it on airport mode, but it's uh, the cell phone. That's what we're videoing. It. That's hilarious. <laughs> why am I? Just let it go. Let it go. Leave the video. Thank you. There's like so many reasons that's hilarious. And I, I'm interrupting my own talk. <laughs> <laughs> to meditate. <laughs> Integration. The countervailing one for this, as we all know, when you're thinking of that, you are what you really think. <laughs> You are the sum total of the five people you spend the most time with. The five people you spend time with, you will begin to move to their mean weight. Your IQ will begin to move to the mean IQ. Your rhythms in your brain begin to harmonize. You are the sum total of the five people you spend your time with. So with techne, when you hear my little blurb that I said where I'm going to run out of here as fast as possible, it's because I try to make sure that I live my life close to people that are like the folks in the aisle. And then I leave it. It's not cool. Because that's what I govern, and it makes life a lot easier if you're interested in learning everything. Okay? Okay, solving for time, growing. Here's what you did. Gratitude practice we know works. There's a mountain of evidence. You just did it three times. So you developed a gratitude practice. If you've already got one, you just went a little further. Exercise. The number one exercise in all cause mortality that you're going to want to watch for is hip. And so this, which is our natural thing, is what gets screwed by all the sitting. And if you don't do that little exercise, just that little hip thing, just as much as you did, you're going to be at a much higher risk for dying from falling and these types of things. You're not thinking about that now because you're young, but you've now done it three times. It's the most important exercise. You now have an exercise practice. If you came here and you're not exercising and you're thinking, I really got to get going, you've now done it three times. Three, right? It's a pattern. You started to exercise. Communication. You want to get your data out. You want to be empowered. You've got to be able to represent yourself. You will be judged by people the instant that you meet them. And if you've grown up in Canada, you're going to say, hi, my name is Pakistan. Right? Sorry, I exist. <laughs> and that's like, oh, we're polite. Except the message I've received is you do not trust yourself. Therefore, I have diminished the merit of your work. You're doing important work, so it matters. So it is bizarre that we're not good at saying our own names. Like, how weird is that? And it's because we don't pay attention to it. So what you do is you say hello. You say hello for a reason. When I begin speaking, if I've got an accent that you're not used to, you're like, I cannot understand this guy at all. Nine seconds later, you're fine. It's because the ear tunes to the new sound and processes it and begins to adapt. 
So if you go and see a play, or if you go to see a movie, or if you deal with a game, you're never going to have somebody pop in through a door and say, it was the butler who did it. Important information never happens right off the hop. You're going to have the person come in and say, wow, what a beautiful sunny day. They're saying pointless stuff to give your ear time to tune. So you say, hello, because the O has that big final tuning. B. My name is. Now, the second part of your relation is, I understand this person. I am going to do something for you. I am making a promise to you. I am going to give you my name. And then you give them your name and you stick the final sound because that creates a cognitive bundle that they then hold. You've just hit highest credibility and highest connection with them. Right? Growth. You've probably all heard this kind of stuff, the static versus the growth mindset. It's a game changer. You can learn anything, right? You get my little thing and it's like, I can make anything better. Sounds grandiose. So can you. You just don't have time, right? So I can learn anything. Changes if you give the presentation and somebody says, hey, your math is wrong. And you're like, oh, I'm an idiot because like my math is, no, you're not, right? You're learning. I'm a learner, I'm a learner, that's awesome, thanks for the note, I just want to get better, right? It breaks my heart when I hear people say, I'm no good at math. Who put that in there? You can learn anything, I'm getting better at math. It is incredibly powerful what you say to yourself. Hello, my name is Patrick Finn, and I can learn anything. I'm learning. I have limited time, so I'm probably not going to get to Russian, but I can learn it, and I want to learn it. I can learn anything. And then integration. I took all of those things and made them into a tiny little bundle. And when you integrate progressive learning exercises, it activates the brain, it gets the breath going, it oxygenates it, it changes your psychological state. So you learn a whack of new exercises, repeated them three times, which establishes a pattern, put them into an integration. And you can do all of that in like, what, 15 seconds a day? Right? Because if what you're wanting to do is make game-changing stuff, you are also a technology. Sitting makes you dumb. Sorry, right? Are you doing the things to be smarter or are you just working flat out and then doing a whole bunch of things that are making you dumb? Because if you're actually interested in improving, then doing that little hip pinch thing, that's all you need to do. Like, if you want to go and get into CrossFit, like, do it. But that's like a, that's like a big time commitment. This is enough. You grab the pieces that are far up the tree and implement from there, and you've already started. You've already started on all those pieces. Boosh. I really don't like how that clicker work. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.